esto. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 2023 Spring Gathering. We are living in a time of profound transformation. The foundational elements of our society, like the very notion of what constitutes a home, who can access it, sorry, starting a timer, who can access it and who gets to decide are being questioned and reshaped. In the midst of these challenges, the reverberations of change impact every aspect of our lives, but perhaps nowhere are they felt more deeply than in our neighborhoods, our communities, our homes. The issue of affordable housing is a crisis, yes, but it's more than that. It's a mere reflecting our societal values, a gauge of our collective empathy, and a testament to our belief in the fundamental human dignity of all. Housing is a human right, is not simply a slogan. It is a call to arms, a call to responsibility, and a call to compassion. We must recognize the crisis of housing. We must recognize that the, the crisis of housing is a deeply interwoven, is deeply interwoven with other forms of inequality. The neighborhoods where we grow up determine the schools we attend, the quality of air we breathe, the safety of streets we walk, and the opportunities available to us. The struggle for housing justice is inherently linked with struggles for educational inequality, environmental justice, and economic fairness. Home ownership in our society, often a symbol of stability and success, has inadvertently created another level of disparity. For many, a home is their primary asset, the foundation of their wealth and credit. This system ties the financial well being of homeowners to ever increasing housing prices, inadvertently driving up costs and creating barriers for lower income and first time buyers. This cycle not only restricts home ownership, but also inflates rents, pushing quality housing further out of reach for many tenants. Our call is to challenge the system. We must redefine housing, not as a commodity, but as a basic human right. It's about ensuring that people can afford to live in the communities they call home. It's about reimagining a housing landscape where everyone has access to a safe, decent, and affordable home. Where our neighborhoods are built around the needs and aspirations of residents, rather than the whims of the market. Yes, this is a tough road ahead, but our belief in the power of collective action the strength of our shared values and the justice of our cause makes me optimistic. Our unity is our greatest asset. Together, we can challenge the status quo, rewrite the narrative, and place human dignity at the center of our housing policies. Today, let's engage in meaningful dialogue, develop actionable strategies, and reinforce our commitment to making housing a human right. Not just a slogan, but a reality. We strive for a Wisconsin where every person has an affordable home, a vibrant community, and a sustainable future. Thank you for standing for justice, for believing in the power of collective action, and for being here today. Welcome to the 2023 Wisconsin Green Party Spring Gathering. Together, let's make our vision of a just and equitable future reality. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. All right. So without further ado, why don't we get into our discussion on housing as a human right? Um, so we're joined today by some of our special guests um, who are uh, 2023 Green candidates and elected officials. Um, so we have, uh, you know, from here in Madison, John Duncan, uh, Marsha Rummel and Juliana Bennett uh, on the Madison Common Council, and also um, Sam Harshner, uh, who ran for the Shorewood Village trustee. And uh, yeah, and so basically, you know, it's a very large topic, but, um, you know, we wanted to start out by just uh, handing the floor to our guests and, you know, hearing their perspectives on. The topic of housing, and um, you know, basically what what they see as some of the most salient issues with that today. 
Um, so uh, why don't we, we'll just uh, do alphabetical order to start. So we'll go with uh, Juliana, um, then John, then Sam, then Marsha. Um, yeah, and, and you can take, um, you know, five, 10 minutes to talk if you like. Um, and then we'll, we'll go around um, to hear from our guests first. And um, after that, we'll open it up for some Q&A. And then finally, uh, you, you know, we'll um, open it up for some comment from our members. Um, so, um, Juliana. I don't want to start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You can, you can pass it. Um, you know, okay. if you want to oh, come back to me. <laughs> okay. So we can no just problem. keep passing around, right? We can just keep passing around, Dave. <laughs> um, I pass. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm, happy to go. I'm happy to go. Um, I want to thank you all for letting me come and speak today. Um, this is my first term on the Madison Common Council. Uh, I have lived in Madison now for about two and a half years. I moved here from Texas. And I definitely can see that in Madison, we have a um, issue and a struggle uh, with affordable housing. And I think that there are a lot of things that we from the city standpoint can start to look at to try to help assist with the affordable housing crisis and a lot of the things one of the things that I think kind of went into play last council was around the uh, trans-oriented development overlay zoning district I think that allowed the opportunity to uh, ease some of the zoning requirements in the high density parts of the city uh, which I think will allow for uh, more housing to come into that area that is is desperately needed in uh, especially the downtown area around the University of Wisconsin. And even as you start to kind of go out onto the west side and the east side, um, knowing that we also have to make sure that when we are building these new affordable housing um, projects that we're also looking at making sure that there is a transportation access uh, to be able to navigate around the city. Um, I, I feel as though that with any time that housing projects are coming um, into the city, one of the things that we have to start looking at is making sure that there is a potential certain amount um, of the rental units that are um, affordable, that are basically under uh, or below that 30% of the area media income, because it's great to have a lot of buildings going up around the Madison area. But if, if you're looking at the cost of $1,500 and $1,600 for a one bedroom apartment, um, that kind of puts that area out um, of any range for people to actually be able to have those housings. I think one thing that the city can potentially look at is uh, possibly starting to buy some of the buildings. Um, I think that that is a great way for um, the city to be able to provide that affordable housing is if we are owning those buildings from a city standpoint, then we can really start to lower the cost um, of the renting, the, the owning or the rental properties for the city. Um, I also think that what might be beneficial once you get out from the standpoint of looking at apartments and housing that way, just being able to potentially build a trust fund um, to help uh, individuals see that dream of being able to potentially have their first home, um, helping and kind of working in a way that uh, the city is maybe buying these properties and it is a lower kind of rent with the understanding that once at the end of that kind of paying those payments, um, you as a person paying those gets to become uh, the owner of that house. And I think that those are things that it's not easy. Uh, I, I think we, we see that every day with affordable housing, that it is a struggle uh, to try to figure out how we can make things um, correct for everyone. Um, but I think that we've got to be able to work together and collaborate 
at the city, at the local level, even at the nonprofit level, focusing on some nonprofit developers uh, to see if they would be able to kind of assist uh, in making sure that we have those affordable housing units all across Madison, all across Wisconsin, uh, so that everyone has the ability to live where they want to live without being pushed out um, and, and further pushed out from, from the kind of areas of the states and the cities. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk more, but at this point, I will uh, go ahead and pass it on to, I think, Marsha, you're next. Or you can pass. <laughs> If we're Alpha, Sam's next. Yeah, that's uh, just what I was going to say. Um, yeah, so why don't we go to Sam next, uh, and then Marsha, and then we can come back to Juliana. Uh, so Sam, go right ahead. Mind if I share my screen? I put together a few slides. You can't. Uh, you can take the professor out of the classroom, but you can't. Uh, you know, he's going to take his slides with him no matter what. So is that yeah. okay? <laughs> um. Yeah, so uh, Sam, can you, uh, that is Sam Chance, or Melissa, uh, can you give Sam Harshner that ability? Okay, great. You see? Okay, so no, I, I thought about this a lot. It was a big issue in my campaign. Um, uh, I, uh, there were, there were two pretty, uh, pretty extreme versions of this, uh, in, uh, amongst my two opponents. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I wanted to, um, essentially, um, I wanted to, I wanted to run through my thoughts on this, uh, on the housing issue, uh, given this, uh, given the context of my race. So I really think if we're looking at the housing crisis in this country, we're looking primarily at this crisis of accumulation, that profits are so, that profits are so high in this country, uh, but the investment opportunities are so infrequent uh, that, uh, that people are basically storing their money in housing, right? So, so we're, seeing, we're seeing that happen in a number of ways. Um, low yields on productive activities, like there's a next quarter ethos, you always got to show profits, right? Um, and and also you see you, you see people trying to capitalize on public priorities, meaning anything the government's going to backstop, you're going to see private industry kind of gravitate towards in this uh, in this in this context. Um, let me see. Can, is this going? OK, so what's the, the attraction of housing from my perspective? Right. Is that it's got government support on all sorts of levels, um, you know, uh, from the from, you know, kind of from mortgage assistance to to public housing pro programs that that uh, that help private investors. Um, and really, you know, also it's, it's, it's kind of set up as the American path to the middle class. It's the only way you produce wealth, um, uh, which is, which is creating a shortage. Right. Um, and so really uh, just, just to show you the way that how intimately this is tied to wealth. If you look at median family wealth by race and ethnicity in 2016, this is the most recent data I could find the different distance between white and black families, median families is $171,000. And if you look at median home price in 2016, what you see is that median home price was about $171,000, which suggests to us that the the um, the, the failure of, of you know kind of old you know old programs to to fully include black uh, black men and women in, uh, in in kind of this home building you know, home buying you know kind of population is a big portion of what we're looking at when we're looking at the wealth gap. Okay, so on top of this, what we're seeing is big hedge funds coming in and um, and buying up housing as a way, primarily in like kind of affluent areas, places with good school districts, places which are going to be desirable, right? So Berkshire Hathaway has a realty service now, right? So that's Buffett, right? And just to show you kind of the, the increase in this, in, um, in what's going on, the investor share of home purchases in, um, this is this is the most recent data I could find, in the fourth quarter of 2021 reached 18.4%, right? We're, we're viewing, uh, we're looking at a situation in which investors and not, not you know, homeowners are buying up almost 20% of homes. Um, and I'm guessing in a place like Madison, this is happening pretty frequently where, where home values are really high. Um, certainly in Shorewood, which is an affluent suburb of, of Milwaukee, it's very similar. Um, so when we look at then we look at the shortage here, we see all the all the areas in brown and yellow. These are these are areas of shortage. I'm surprised that Dane County isn't darker on that front, but uh, but Milwaukee is is certainly uh, is certainly one of the places where we're seeing this big housing shortage. Um, right, the average share, as you know, uh, average share of monthly household income going to rent in the U.S. is reaching you know an all time high. We're at like about thirty percent, right? Um, and there's no equity be, being built there. This is only exacerbating existing existing problems. And so in Shorewood, what I saw was 
a um, a breakdown of this uh, of this debate along li the lines of NIMBYism, classic, right? You know, old school suburbanite life, uh, suburbanite stuff. Don't don't build stuff here. We want to keep the the character of the village, you know, kind of the same. Or we want uh, we don't want to lose parking, right? All the excuses that you expect with people who don't want to build build up more housing. And then the other side, a YIMBYism that I that I want to say is um, is is certainly closer to to right. But also one that I think, in, in its uncritical form, um, is is really uh, really providing a boon to private investors without necessarily directly solving the solving the housing supply issues that we're looking at. And I'm not saying that happens everywhere. I'm saying in my in my locality, what we're seeing is that the way people are operationalizing this this yimbyism uh, is problematic and something we need to keep uh, keep an eye on. Right. And so one thing I want to point out here is this is the Wisconsin. Uh, Institute on Law and Liberty. You guys may, may know them. Know that they're, they're a conservative uh, organization within Wisconsin, advocating you know for free market approaches. And what we see here is a is a is a text. A, I'm sorry, a tweet that says, "Will is examine the ways in which government regulation has actually contributed to the rising cost of home prices in Wisconsin, recommending both state and local policymakers to remove barriers to development of more affordable market rate housing, using the language of NIMBYism, right." In, in advancing in advancing a, um, a kind of a right wing uh, right wing um, kind of a, approach to the economy. So how does that how does that work? Right. We, we think we know and it's true. Right. More supply is going to create should keep create, you know, more, um, you know, kind of uh, sh should, uh, you know, more closely approximate demand. And we should see rent prices go down. Right. What we see, however, is, again, we're seeing these we're seeing these firms chase government backstops, government supported investment. Um, and so we see tax the, the the places that are building these in in Shorewood, the places that are building these um, uh, these facilities are using tax incremental financing with all its inherent kind of regressivity, right? I, not, I'm not an, an, an antagonist to using TIF when we can get something out of it, but but there is you know uh, it is uh, it is propping up private investment with public dollars. It's not the ideal solution. We're um, zoning waivers for people uh, to to uh, you know to do uh, to do more you know take up more space, higher buildings, these sorts of things. We've seen luxury condos built instead of affordable units. We've seen broken commitments from developers who came in promising to put affordable units in their in their facilities and then backed out, saying it was unfeasible. We saw substantial rate increases in, in rent immediately after people got their got their places in in operation, as sometimes as much as twenty to thirty percent a year. And we're seeing in in uh, in some of the facilities, older older apartments in town, tenant unions being organized because of mold issues. Uh, you know, elevators that are threatening to literally you know kind of just fall down the shaft. Just terrible conditions across the board. Right. So my solution, the way I wanted to approach this, and it's, it's hard to communicate given the, the technicality of the issues at, at hand, is, is to really focus on, you know, um, you, you guys in Madison know Joel Rogers, I'm sure, he, what he calls a high road economic, uh, high road local development, high, high road economic development, meaning we have these levers to pull from a regulatory and, and financing standpoint, and we need to get something directly for them. Meaning we have to we have to use democracy to counter the the just the pure profit motive of of uh, you know of developers that are coming into our areas, right? So so I would advocate um, maintaining you know these levers of power, not to keep uh, developments from happening, right? Uh, because we want we want more units, right? But to ensure that when those units are those units are built, that they, that we have uh, we can we can ensure robust tenant protections. That we can leverage uh, leverage developers for affordable units. That we could do things like uh, potentially find you know during a teacher teacher shortage find units for for uh, for public school teachers to to enter into uh, maybe at, at maybe for a period of two years as they first start out things like that um, using using the levers of power we have both through TIF financing and through regulatory authority to to uh, to leverage developers who are making a profit off uh, using using you know kind of public authority and public dollars. Um, for for benefits, direct benefits to the community, I think, and that's uh, you know that's kind of what I've been selling. Um, it was a popular message. I lost I lost my election for for reasons of uh, you know technical incompetence, I think, uh, which I'd be happy to expand on. But the message really delivered to people, right? And the the other issue here is that, and this and this is a forum where this is this can be helpful, is that if we're going to do something like this, then um, you know the the you know kind of the, the the road to the road to the bottom is is always you know always you know kind of uh, always there. The least common denominator is that some somebody can somebody can go in and say we'll give you all the benefits and none of the burdens. 
uh, and and you know uh, developers will go to that locality, right? So this the, any any effort to do this sort of leveraging of power, I think in Madison it's a little easier because it's such an attractive location. But uh, with smaller localities, uh, you need horizontal organizing at the local level, cooperation, uh, a common set of principles. Because at the end of the day, this this does help all localities if uh, if we're able to, to use our democratic authority to counter you know kind of just the, the that uh, that profit motive of of, uh, of the people um, uh, the people we're, we're working with. So I'll stop there. Sorry about going so long. Um, I'll uh, I'll, I'll uh, stop that right now. One second. Is it stop? Okay. All right. Onwards. Sorry, guys. I, I think I went long. Thank you no so much. Yeah. No, that was uh, that was great. Yeah. So thank you. Um, wealth of information. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, why don't we uh, pass it to Marsha next. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That was really excellent. And so far, the conversation from the introductions on has been really like at the highest level of like what we need to be thinking about as Greens and socialists. So what? how do we deal with this market-based economy that doesn't guarantee anybody a right to a housing. Um, when I ran again, I decided to really focus on um, affordable housing, not just housing. Everyone says we have a housing crisis, yes. But what I've observed is that we have, you know, new um, high-end housing being built, rental, no real condos or any kind of home ownership, at least in the central core of Madison, but no one can afford to live there. Or some people can, but most people can't. And 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 that Yimby argument that Sam mentioned was has this idea that somehow the the trickle down effect of these high end um, new units will pressure the middle high end units to go down in price. But that might be true. But still, people can't afford those in general. So we're not serving the um, people who are making fifty percent or less of the area median income. Dane County is a really wealthy county. So 50% of the area median income is pretty darn high. So um, it's it's something that we need to discuss is like, what is the housing wage that you need to be able to afford housing at what is 30% of your income, which is according to Fed standards of HUD, affordable. 30% uh, of your housing is what you, sh uh, your income is what you should pay for shelter. So with these sort of bigger questions, um, I also wanted to echo what I heard Sam say, the kind of neighborhoods that we want. I think we really want um, human scale, urban, walkable neighborhoods served by transit, neighborhoods serving businesses, cultural and recreational amenities, good schools, and with a mix of housing points and uh, housing types and price points, we should not be planning in any urban area for suburban land uses. You know, these big, you know, large acre sites with the single family house, um, whether or not we wanna promote like no more single family zoning, I think the point is that that kind of land use is not what we should be um, sponsoring in the core of our city. Um, we need to have, a reasonable amount of more density in order to, to best serve people. Um, and so when I think about what we can do, I mean, we know we know the market isn't serving us. Uh, we, but, and there's, I think there are things that we can do that, that maybe won't really solve the fact that we're trying to operate under capitalism or the, where it's fixed against people who don't own land, but, um, I think what we can look at is this notion of social housing. And I've been studying this idea a lot and I know it's not a new idea, but it's using things like cooperatives, land trusts, land banking, um, and other forms of organization where the community either owns or organizes the, the management of their housing. Um, so, I think what, as a as the Green Party should do, and a socialist, we should be arguing for non-market solutions. I mean, somebody said, "Yeah, you can you can build more housing, but still, even if you subsidize it, at some point that subsidy gets timed out and it goes back to market rate." So I think what um, I would like us to work on as 
collectively is, you know, limited equity cooperatives, co-housing, land banking, land trusts, tiny home villages. We should partner with nonprofits that do community development. And I think we should push the city to, to build housing. I mean, the last time Madison built any publicly owned housing was probably, I mean, they are refitting now and retrofitting now and adding some new units. But before that, it was probably since the 1960s that the city of Madison built um, you know, publicly owned housing. I think we need to have a community discussion that while we definitely need housing geared to the 30 percent of area median income and less, we also probably need more in mixed income housing that the city could be owners of so that we have the opportunity to have to you know lift every boat as they kind of talk about when with inclusionary zoning. Um, so I think somebody mentions the city should buy housing. I, I think so. I think that we should work on buying um, units or, or in partnership with nonprofits. We should and any time the city gives money, we should deed restrict um, how long it stays affordable so it's permanently affordable. Um, you know, and, and, and Sam did a really great job talking about the wealth gap with African Americans. I think we really need to elevate that conversation and talk about not just rental opportunities, but homeowner opportunities and what do we need to make sure that more people have a fair chance to build wealth through housing. Um, so I think also TIF, as, as Sam mentioned, is a really important tool. I think Madison has done a decent job over the years of revisiting our TIF policy. And I'm gonna start pushing for doing that again so that we look at putting aside money, um, actual money, not just like for parking or whatever land acquisition, but for affordable housing. And anytime we give money to a, a developer, um, I think the city could and have a municipal bank. Like we're paying, you know, developers, you know, even the ones that kind of want to do better say, oh, I can't afford this. Oh, the banker says this, the banker won't approve that. That we don't ever have the bankers at the table, the lenders, the financial institutions. You know, often as an alder, you'll meet with neighbors and the developer and neighbors will say, we want this and that. And we want, you know, usually they all ask for affordable housing, mostly in downtown Madison. And the developers who aren't experts at that will say, well, I don't really know. That's not my wheelhouse. Well, how do we make it their wheelhouse so that they have more uh, a learning curve, surely, but they can improve um, the sources of funds that they would use. But again, it's back to do we really want to just rely on the private market? So I do think that we need to go back to um, city ownership and, and whether all the various ways. Um, and I think also in Madison, especially, we haven't invested in any, I mean, we give sort of assistance to somebody trying to buy a single family house, but we're not investing in building multi-unit condos yet that would be home that would be owner occupied and I really think that's something that we should push for and maybe that won't serve the higher end of the market but I think then make people might move out of apartments that they that are let more affordable and open them up um, and I have a lot more things like this but one last thing and I, I know Juliana will probably talk about it is the importance of tenant organizing that I think we've seen that across the country where tenants are organizing um, now and maybe they're at a disadvantage because it's like obviously a seller's market but i think that we as as as, as greens and socialists need to work with communities to help them develop their um their skills to to um, self-organize in their housing um and then as, i think we need to focus on youth and student housing and i think that's juliana's like forte so i'm giving you like a thing where you can start going soon that we um that we have options for younger people, especially um, young people aging out of foster care. They are like really um, at, at risk a lot of homelessness. Um, we didn't really talk about homeless, I didn't really talk about homelessness, but I think that we definitely have improved in our city since COVID, but it's really sad that COVID was what made us improve because no longer could people be shoved into a church basement, you know, for their health and safety and now we needed to do more purpose-built 
kind of shelters, which Madison is doing. But we still need to keep working on getting people the, you know, into housing with a housing first kind of strategy. So I guess I'll end there. Um, I, and there's a lot to talk about and I don't, I'll stop there and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Marcia. Um, yeah, so why don't we pass it over to Juliana and then after that, um, you know, we can start some Q and A. So if you want to start thinking up their questions. Um, so Juliana, take it away. Sweet. Thank you, Dave. Oh my gosh. I'm glad I did not go first because you guys are so good. And I'm like, all right, how do I, um, I'm glad I had more time to prepare. <laughs> um, and also I'm like, we're lucky to be joined by, you know, uh, I would see housing experts like John is on plan commission, Marsha's on UDC, and has sat on plan commission in the past. Um, sorry, Sam, I don't know your background, um, but I'm sure you're great in housing too. Um, before I started out, I kind of want to get a, give a little bit of background on me, um, in, specifically in relation to housing um, that kind of extends beyond my role on city council. Um, so I would say, starting off, I have experienced housing insecurity um, really since my mom passed away um, when I was nine. Um, when that happened, we moved from the suburbs of Chicago down to Bullitt, Wisconsin. Um, I've gone through like living in hotels, um, living Um, you know, where um, I struggled to pay rent, barely could pay rent every month. Um, and even um, last year, you know, got that scary five day eviction notice. Um, and um, since then, you know, kind of that background is what really makes me, made me passionate about housing and um, why I'm really happy to be on, have this role on council to work on these issues and even why I changed my major um, to real estate, which I recently graduated from the real estate school in Madison, um, at UW-Madison um, and began uh, my day job on the policy team at the Wisconsin Housing Economic Development Authority or WIDA. So, very passionate about housing. I literally talk about housing all day of my life now. So, um, and with all of that, um, I kind of want to start this out with, this is not just a, a Madison discussion. I understand many people from Milwaukee. It's not just a Madison or Milwaukee discussion. It is a statewide issue. It is a national issue that everyone is talking about. Wisconsin is currently in a shortage of 120,000 affordable um, residential units. Um, and nationally, for every one household that gets an affordable unit, there are two other households that need such a unit or home. Um, in my time working um, on this issue, both on council and now in my role at WIDA, I've learned that housing is truly a nonpartisan issue. Um, people on both sides of the aisle are trying to solve this issue because it is an everything issue. Everyone needs a place to live. Um, when we talk about how we got here with the affordable housing um, crisis, I know I don't know if I heard anybody talking about what's happening in the state level. Um, but in state government, we're obviously prohibited from doing inclusionary zoning or rent control. Um, this comes from the Republicans who really shot themselves in the foot because in their um, attempts to open up um, the housing to free market, um, they've created a situation where their workers of their <laughs> Uh, power plants and manufacturing companies and rural communities um, can't afford to work for them anymore um, because they can't afford a home um, where their companies are. So they're kind of 
really upset about that. And now they're trying to address this issue. And I can speak to this now because um, it was finally introduced. Um, but um, I know for WIDA had um, been working closely with um, state legislators um, who recently introduced um, a workforce housing package, um, which is a package of bills aimed at addressing the affordable housing crisis um, with a $1 billion investment um, that will like, establish a revolving um, loan fund um, to help reduce barriers um, to creating housing, specifically um, asking local governments um, to voluntarily um, eliminate their barriers to affordable housing and eliminate NIMBYism in their communities. So that is a very recent thing that's very exciting um, that's coming before us today and really marks that everyone cares about this issue. Um, and so moving from there, local government is truly, I think, oh, did I leave? No, I'm not, I'm still here. Okay, local government is truly the number one way that we can address um, um, this crisis. Um, and that is, you know, because of the nimbyism that we see. And um, not trying to pick on you, Marsha, on UDC. This is before your time that you got there. But when I was on a uh, Urban Design Commission member, one situation that sticks out to me is there was a um, proposal for 515 units of affordable housing um, in District 12, and Urban Design Commission members decided to, not myself, I voted no, but the rest of the committee decided to vote against the proposal because they thought it looked quote unquote too suburban and not urban enough. Um, and because they didn't like the colors that they were using. Um, and these are the types of very NIMBY, very um, self-serving arguments that are not moving us forward as a city. So I strongly believe um, in zoning reforms, um, utilizing our TIF policy and overall reducing barriers. Um, we often put perfect at the behest of good um, and this is, and also I strongly believe that we need housing at all levels. Um, this is one area where I personally am in disagreement with the mayor of Madison, where she very much so believes that the only way, the only and best way to, um, you know, solve our affordable housing crisis is to increase density. Um, and we can put up as many luxury high-rise units as we want to, um, but that's not gonna solve our affordable housing crisis. We need housing of all types um, for all the people that live in Madison, not just people that can afford luxury prices. Um, so yeah, going back to that, uh, zoning reforms, um, during my time as Alder, I would love to see us remove single family uh, zoning, Marsha. <laughs> um, I would love for us to open up our TIF policy. It is on staff's um, plan this year to open up our TIF policy. Um, you can talk to Matt Mikolojewski to learn more about that. Um, I'm really interested in reducing barriers with the Urban Design Commission process. Um, and overall, just a better city planning that inherently encourages affordable housing. Um, and going back to what uh, Marsha kind of put towards me in um, her comments, um, we need to um, not just work on what property owners can do for us, but also empower tenants for what they can do for themselves. Um, as tenants, we're often put to the mercy of property owners, um, mainly because of the state that we are in. Um, However, I do believe that we should have like a guild or coalition of tenants working um, to provide information and learning to tenants um, to help them resolve their um, barriers to entry, like having a co-signer, having down payments, um, dealing with shitty landlords in general. Um, 
so that's something I'm also interested in and I know I talked for a long time but I um that is all my encompassing comments thank you thank you yeah thank you very much um wow so yeah, I have to agree with Marsha that the level of discourse has been, you know, exactly what we need. And yeah, so this is why, you know, I was looking forward so much to this panel. Um, so yeah, so thanks to all of our uh, guests. And um, now, so if, if people have questions, you could either uh, you know, get on stack and then, you know, we'll call on you if, or if you just want to put your question uh, uh, directly into the chat and, um, you know, uh, we as the facilitators can read them off. Um, so, yeah, and we'll, and we'll try to go in stack order. So, you know, whether people get on stack in the chat or if they, you know, just put their questions directly in the chat, we'll try to uh, keep it in in order that people go. Um, all right. So I see uh, first we have Bill, and then we have uh, Barbara Dahlgren. So go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I just had a question about tenant organizing experiences in both Milwaukee and Madison. Um, I know there is a tenant organization in Milwaukee of some sort. I don't know about Madison. I don't know uh, much about the track record and what kind of successes and what um, what the uh, organizations have been concentrating on. Sam or anyone else, if, if you could answer that, I'd, I'd appreciate it. I can talk about Milwaukee if that's okay. There is a, um, there's something called the Milwaukee Autonomous Tenants Union, MATU, that has been organizing in a number of buildings, including one in my, in my little town in Shorewood. Um, Tenant organizing, I think, uh, is is hugely. It can be hugely helpful, and certainly the the building in Shorewood has gotten some concessions from the owners of the building in terms of replacing some faulty infrastructure, things along those lines. It's a lot of work, though, and it's a it's a tough uh, it's it's a tough road to hoe. So I think it's you know I mean if um, you know uh, if you're going to do it, the the people need to commit a lot of resources to it and 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 a lot of time. And so it's it's uh, it's not something certainly that happens spontaneously. It's certainly not something that happens without a lot of without a lot of work. So um, limited successes, but uh, but some in Milwaukee. All right. Thanks. So um, was that question just for Sam? Um, I think that he was asking about Madison too, but if there's anything. Okay. Did anyone else want to speak to that question? Yeah, if I could speak a little bit. Madison doesn't, Madison has a group through that exists uh, that I'm aware of that DSA has organized, but I, I don't really know of their anecdotal struggles and the success or failure thereof. Um, you know, we have resources for tenants, but not resources for tenants to be organized. Um, pretty much that's kind of what I know. Um, pass. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, unless anyone else wants to speak to that question. Then. I mean, I think Marsha um, got it, but we do have the Tenant Resource Center, but um, like um, we were saying, um, we, we, I think it's also just underfunded and like um, people don't know about it as much as they should um, about that resource. I, I really wish that we had like a tenants union or something something of the sort where we could have bargaining power with landlords, but I don't even know how that would work. Julianne, I can get you in touch with the people in Milwaukee if that'd be helpful. Yeah, that'd be great. Sam put in the, this, um, this <clears throat> chat about the Madison effort.
Okay, great. Thank you. So um, we can go to our next question. So we have Barbara, then AJ, then Melissa. Uh, go ahead, Barbara. Yeah, I, mean, I got a couple comments and, and questions. I really liked what Juliana had to say about um, disagreeing with density. And, you know, you can put up as many luxury highlight, high rises as you want, and you're never going to solve it because they're just going to sit empty with whoever um, can afford that, which is usually a high level. So I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to make sure people knew about something that the Greater Milwaukee Green Party has uh, been for for a long time, the Poor People's Army that's run by Sherry Honkla, and, and that's mostly local out of um, Pennsylvania. But pretty much they have been directly confronting um, the housing and urban development and directly just putting people in those houses, um, you know, under the radar because it's not, they're not really supposed to. But there's houses that housing and urban development owns that are just sitting empty. And, and I'm wondering if that's the case with state and local um, too, if there's just stuff that's sitting open and empty that people are just not getting, um, getting that filled. So that's one question. Um, another question is about the, the TIF districts particularly. I know that they take away from um, education. So it's, it's usually that that was just skimmed right off the top of the education budget. So um, are there concerns about if we go into that lane of taking that money and trying to use it, that we're still kind of misappropriating from education and that there just should be a proper budget for both. Um, especially because like in Milwaukee and where I live in West Dallas, um, over 50% of the budget or about 50% goes to the police department. And clearly that's not, um, you know, 50% of the services of the city. Um, thanks. And thanks for being here. I appreciate hearing all, all of what you had to say. So what I would like to respond. Um, okay. I see a hand from Juliana, so go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for your comments. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I can't speak, I can speak to my blue on face about this luxury high rises. I swear, I mean, we have um, a proposal that we're going to see at council soon to get ready. Um, <laughs> um to vote on it um you too um but it's demolishing 75 units of naturally occurring affordable housing in lieu of luxury high rises um and the developer was asked several times like can you like why can't you put in affordable housing like you this developer has also done other projects that like the olive madison which i'm sure my council members will remember um, or could, would know that created um, a set aside for affordable housing units. And developers said that they wanted to be competitive with their other developments that have luxury high rises. And for context, um, when I lived at the James, this is one of the developments they're talking about, a studio, I mean, a literal closet of a studio costs $1,100. And that was in 2019. And today in 2023, they're charging $1,600 for that same studio. So within the matter of like four years, they raised their rents $500 from $1,100 to $1,600 for a studio. It's absolutely outrageous. As um, for TIFF though, um, I would say like it, it does have a um, nominal impact on um, the school board and that's just because of how TIF is structured. Um, instead of the tax revenues going to the school, it's going towards the city. But I would also, but I would argue that having 
affordable homes for families with children to live in is just as important as having um, good schools. And also um, all of those revenues from TIF gets reinvested into the community. So having um, better community spaces, better parks, better um, public infrastructure all adds to the overall raising of children and families. So I think that's just as important personally. I forget your last question too, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, um, so I, I saw Marsha's hand was raised and, you know, I would say panelists, you can just feel free to, uh, you know, to jump in. Um, and answer the questions because I don't want to, uh, you know, miss. Um, yeah, let's just not use the hand raise function. Uh, if people want to ask questions, then get on the stack in the chat. And panelists, if you want to respond to a question, uh, feel free. Um, so, Marsha, go ahead. Thanks for clarifying that, Dave. I don't want to talk too much, but I do have things I can think of when someone asks a question. Um, I think Juliana answered a lot of the stuff about TIF, but I just want to make sure that um, that Barbara and everyone understands, like when TIF a TIF um, a project is going to get TIF, they set the like a line at what the value is of all the assessment in the district, and anything that was at that level still goes to the school district and other tax jurisdictions. And then the new increment that's come because suddenly they've like making value out of the sky, which is kind of what this they do, right? They build something up that's five stories from one story and suddenly there's more increment, they call it. They keep that to the inside the district for a number of years and make plans for how to use it. And Juliana mentioned some of those things. So I think it's a um, kind of one of those things that there is a benefit, but definitely, um, the, the standards for what needs TIF is certainly always up for discussion. You know, they have this, this standard called the but for test, you know, but for TIF, something wouldn't happen. Well, certainly we can say that, but for some public investment, affordable housing won't happen, but I don't think it's easy to say, but for, you know, some public investment luxury housing wouldn't happen because that seems to happen just fine. And then to Barbara's first question about the work of the Poor People's Army, there's not really the same situation that I'm aware of in Madison where there's any empty housing. I mean, there might be some that went to foreclosure, that kind of thing, but that goes through a process. But I don't really think that there's a lot of empty housing that people could squat in or that kind of like initiative that some have done over the years pass. Can I jump in here real quick? Please. Yeah, I think one of the uh, just to piggyback off of uh, uh, what the, the last two commenters said, and, you know, with TIF, I think another issue is that often what what we uh, what is claimed to be a, you know, kind of taxing, you know, tax base increases associated with tax in incremental investments, right, is often actually the natural result of just, you know, kind of increasing housing prices. And so, you know, I mean, we in this in this area, we've seen, um, you know, in Shorewood, you know, housing prices go through the roof. And it's fundamentally an issue of schools and people wanting to have access to, to good education um, and a limited housing stock. Um, and the um, the community continuously, uh, you know, or the, the government continuously claims that that's a function of, of TIF investments. You know, what that means is that we're essentially tying up, you know, kind of tax revenue we would have had anyways. Right in in um, in uh, funding these projects as opposed to doing things like funding education, which we could which we could be doing with this uh, with this funding otherwise. So you know, TIF. My my take on TIF is if you're not getting a direct benefit immediately, not just this abstract idea of taxing uh, tax base increases. It's difficult. Um, it, you know, it's it's it's. I don't necessarily see the benefit. Right, you got to be really careful with it. Right, it can really eat into your into your tax base, uh, you know, for for decades if you're not uh, if you're not careful and you don't do it right. So, I'll stop. All right, thank you. Um, so why don't we get to the next questions? Um, so AJ, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to get on the um, the TIF question. 
theme at the moment because I guess so my study of TIF districts pr primarily in the Midwest um, now looking outside of the TIF districts that there's a lot of what I would consider like consequences when you have TIF districts that while there is something to be said to create a TIF district for the betterment for development and to improve things but there's also those repercussions that TIF districts have with adjacent locations with those TIF districts where they actually raise property tax values outside of the TIF districts also. So like there's been TIF districts in Milwaukee where a $200,000 home, which would be, you know, with, with, with $200,000 home that's near a TIF district sees that would be $4,700 would jump up to $5,000. You know, and we've seen this in Chicago also with the nearly 200 TIF districts in Chicago. And like we've, there's been property values have risen over the years because of that. Even places in Western Illinois have seen this and places in Eastern Iowa have seen this. So if some of those here on the panel could possibly address that while TIF districts may help with certain housing solutions, you know, what could it be said for what it could affect housing outside of TIF districts when it comes to like raising property value. I'd say that it's hard to know exactly the direct link from what happens in an adjacent area. I would say in Madison, it seems like housing prices are just going up. Like my, where I live now used to be like the, you know, it's now kind of the like up and well, not even it's up and risen and it's expensive. So people who want to live in a kind of coolish east side neighborhood now have to go further away. And so I don't really know how to separate those kind of factors from what the Tiffins, you know, might have done to things. So it's it's hard for me to know without more, you know, study. Thanks. Um, for me, I, I would just um, point out um, maybe um, it's hard to compare, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking from a strictly Madison perspective, but it's comparing Madison to other Midwest cities, just because Madison significantly underutilizes TIF. Like when we're talking about cities like Chicago, um, or even Milwaukee, I, I know Chicago is up to 25% usage of TIF. Madison is only at 2%. So um, when we increase the amount of um, TIF allocation up to around 25%, which in Wisconsin, the limit is 12.5%, um, you know, you get to see, you start seeing those negative consequences. And also that goes to say that like, you know, obviously with any, um, with any solution, there are um, pros and cons that we have. There, there is no one-stop solution, but um, I don't think that should dissuade us from pursuing TIF as a tool in the toolbox um, for um, creating affordable housing. Okay, thank you. So unless anyone else wants to speak to that question, we can go to the next one. So um, Melissa said her question's been answered. So next up we have Tom and then I put myself on stack after Tom. So go ahead, Tom. Uh, just something quick. Um, so I've been a landlord for quite a while, so I, I make money in my sleep and that in between crises. Um, I had a discussion recently with a co-op that, uh, well, uh, and anyhow, the point is you run into problems and tenants have rights and there's a handbook of rights. And I'm just, for, for the greater public, um, I would suggest in the Milwaukee area, the organizations that would support tenants, there's one called Community advocates there's also a land wisconsin landlord tenant association they have a 
open to the public meeting once a year. And then I am aware of a movement um, in Milwaukee to support tenants in the case of evictions. I think Bill Bryan may know more about that, that group, but I guess I'm just trying to get that name out there, community advocates. And also for tenants, there's a Wisconsin uh, handbook giving tenants their rights. So just kind of throwing general stuff out there. And I'm curious if there's some organizations in Madison we should all bookmark or know about uh, past. The Tenant Resource Center would be in Madison, would have a wealth of information and best practices, et cetera. Tenant Resource Center, Community Action Coalition, um, there's the UW Law Defense. Um, also, how are you a landlord? Are you, so I'm assuming you're one of the good ones. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I don't know if you mind me throwing the question back at you, but how do you, um, do you like provide affordable housing? You know, how, what is your thoughts about what other landlords are saying with they can't keep rent affordable? And, things that we've been hearing? Um, I'm not very representative. I don't really run it like a business like I should. Um, I have to fill my taxes out. So uh, can we get this camera too? So long story short, um, I'm probably losing money now, but I will have to re increase rent. So that's always, um, that's, I generally don't increase rent at, so much easier to increase the rent after someone moves out then you just let the market throttle you on the rent but i try to meet it doesn't always work most of the time it doesn't but i try to show up at the one rental property for a meeting once a month people can either be there or not i only have three units so the unit below me I have a very nice relationship with them. I see them several times a week. Um, so yeah, I think I'm good at that. You know, I'm imperfect, uh, but um, that that's it with me. I do have um, landlord advice since I've been a landlord for over 20 years. I can kind of coach you. And, and I did take a class, I think it was six hours long. It was pretty intense. And we came away with a handbook was run by I think Milwaukee County and that it was very good. You came away with a um, like a 80 page uh, <laughs> notebook with tips and uh, you know we really got a good idea of the law um, uh, pass. All right, so. I'm next on stack. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I've had a lot of thoughts about, you know, just provoked by what the panelists have said, but um, I'll try to just limit it to one um, and a question. Um, so, yeah, you know, we hear this all the time, um, and it's kind of the corporate co optation of Yimbyism like Sam was talking about that, you know, adding market rate apartments is going to, um, you know, be the thing to bring about affordable housing. Um, so, you know, I've been thinking about this and just kind of observing what's happening. And it seems to me that, okay, so this is like the free market solution. And it's kind of like adding um, you know, high cost houses to an auction, right? There's like a big auction happening where everyone wants housing. And so you're adding more high end apartments. So there's more available for the wealthiest. So maybe the 
you know, the wealthiest will take these new shiny apartments. And then there might be something left for those who are less wealthy, um, right? But still prices remain high and overall scarcity is maintained, right? There's never enough for everyone. There's always scarcity and developers only build more as long as they can profit from it. Um, and then to make things worse, when they're building these luxury apartments, you know, this happened on the block where I, I lived um, a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, they, they demolish natural affordable housing for luxury apartments. And they say, oh, well now there's 150 apartments. Yeah, but you demolished, you know, 35 affordable apartments. So, you know, it's like, again, going to the auction metaphor, you're taking away, um, you know, these kind of more affordable items and then putting luxury items into the auction. So the effect, you know, that we're seeing in Madison is that, you know, the lower income people are getting moved out and, you know, and pushed out. So, you know, publicly owned housing came up before and I feel like that is the uh, you know, there, there are a number of solutions, including cooperatives and co-housing, but I feel like public housing has a track record, you know, it works. I know there are many countries in, in Europe and probably around the world that use it, but I was wondering if folks know, are there any U.S. cities with good models of publicly owned housing, or do we have to look to other countries and uh, do cities in Wisconsin have the power to buy or build housing? Marsha, I know you mentioned that Madison had done it at one point, so I'm really curious about that. Um, thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm really enjoying this discussion. I think the comments and um, and the panelists um, really put a lot of the most pressing issues of the housing issue, which is in itself a very, very pressing issue, right on the table. I'm in Milwaukee here, and we have the terrible distinction of actually having high quality books, sociological studies like um, like Desmond, um, is it Desmond? The, the, the book evicted on, uh, on, on poverty and housing in Milwaukee. And then there's a book called 53216, I believe, about the zip code where misery is just piled onto misery. And at the center of this is housing. Um, and um, the racial dimension is really at the center of it as well in Milwaukee and elsewhere, as those studies and others show. Um, one of the biggest sources of racial inequality revolves exactly around housing because um, while um, African-American fam households controlling for education and work experience earn 70% of what white households do, their, their household wealth is about 7%. And that's the result of being iced out of the housing market traditionally. So, um, some of the speakers have talked about uh, how, how one of the, the central problem is, is affordable housing and the high cost of housing. On the other side is also stagnating wages. And as eco-socialists, we certainly have things to say about um, increasing the minimum wage, increasing well-paying jobs and the like. Um, and I was also struck with some of the things that Marcia said about the importance of dense urban um, housing. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of evidence that that's not only a good idea to solve housing issues, but it's very good for the environment, as I think many of us on, on this call know, because it leaves the hinterland available for wetlands for enjoying uh, nature and not sprawl, which also becomes a transportation issue as people have to go back and forth here. Um, and uh, so I, I just think that I, I just want to kind of conclude and kind of jump off where Dave uh, said about um, the question of public housing, relying on the We still have a network, we still get videos. I think it's there. Oh, oh as um, expensive uh, upper end housing where there's certainly no lack of opportunities for those at the other end of it. So um, thank you all the panelists. Um, so there's not really a question here, but just a few thoughts that perhaps can uh, 
uh, uh, support some of the things that have been said here. Dave, to your question, I I personally am not aware of kind of any cities in the U.S. that have this kind of public housing approach where the cities are buying the properties um, and then making these affordable units for individuals. But I do think that you know it's seeing what how it is done um, in European countries. It's an approach I think that would benefit and possibly start allowing. Um, cities to to help those people that are in need um, and potentially provide those affordable housing um, units for students, for for families, for anyone really uh, where the city is then kind of managing that and able to make sure that the prices are not continuously going up and up and up. Um, so I see Sam Harshner had to leave. Um, so I don't know, Marsha, Juliana, if you are interested in responding to that, um, or otherwise we can go to our next question. I, um, I did have a couple thoughts. You know, when we, there's a whole like market logic to, you know, I call it the density, density, density. In, in kind of my cynical way approach to things like, you know, everything's better just if you add more density. But as, as Dave mentioned, you demolish, um, you know, naturally occurring affordable housing, which is a term, N-O-A-H, in case you hadn't noticed it. And, but there's no way to inventory what we lose as far as affordability. But what we see is people are displaced and they can't, afford to live in, say, the core of the city or all parts of the city. And then the whole racial component, as Kay mentioned, you know, has historic precedence in, you know, zoning and, and redlining and those kind of things that, you know, maybe now that with the changes in zoning are not so clear, but it, how do you undo that, that legacy? You know, it's not as simple, just, oh, I can buy a house wherever. Um, I think um, the thing I really think about is the the housing wage a lot. Like, what does what do you need to earn in order to afford what's a market apartment in your city? And then, how are we people aff affording these houses? And that's where we come up into like you you're not going to earn like twenty five dollars an hour or whatever it costs to live in that place that Juliana mentioned at sixteen hundred dollars a month. I'm just making up the hours. It could be higher. So, you know, at some point it's all connected and um, it's all connected. And I really think we should be cautious about zoning as a solution to these problems. I think certainly, you know, we changed our zoning in Madison to change the definition of families. That was important because it sort of made an arbitrary distinction if you how many people could live unrelated if the place was owned by somebody versus rented, which kind of made me think about like, well, when I was a younger person just out of college, I lived in a, like a neat old big house with a lot of people and it was probably illegal, but it didn't seem like it was wrong. But the other hand is like the zoning, like, you know, giving the zoning waivers we saw in, in Sam's PowerPoint I, I don't necessarily believe that that's going to create any affordable housing. I think it just gives developers more ability to, you know, by per, by right to just get more luxury housing. So I think we just have to be cautious about some of these solutions. Yes. Thanks, Marsha. So I see that um, Barb E is on stack and we probably have time for just about one more quick question. Um, so Barb, go ahead. And then I think we'll probably wrap it up and take our break. Um, go ahead. Um, I, don't, I don't really have a question, but I wanted to comment because I live in housing cooperative and that's not a very common thing. Most people never heard of it. Most people don't know that we are a cooperative or I live in Milwaukee. Um, but I want 
people to know that they still exist. There aren't very many of them. Um, we've been in existence since the 1970s, I believe. Um, before that, it was low-income housing, housing, and then it was converted to a cooperative in the 70s. Um, it's kind of a nice situation because there, for some people, they don't want the communal living. We, we do share um, the grounds, but we each have our own individual entrance and, and living space. So um, in some ways, it's the best of, of both worlds, but we manage the property together. Um, meet once a month to do business and to do um, work on the property. Um, but it's been more difficult in recent years, I think, just because of the stresses with COVID and, and other things in our lives. So um, I don't think that people are, are participating as much as they have in the past. And that's made it more difficult for us to get our business done. Um, and we have also recently had a, a situation with a really terrible um, tenant member, um, which we've never had in all the years. I've been there 13 years and never had a situation where we had to remove someone. And just recently had to do that, unfortunately. Um, but I think you know people need to learn more about cooperatives because we we are in control of our own. Um, property and how much we pay. We had to, we had to um, vote in order to increase our um, monthly charges and um, makes a big difference in how you feel about where you live. So I'll pass. I think yeah, Barbara's I think right. We, we need more co-ops. I was I started out my remarks talking about limited equity co-ops. There's one in my neighborhood that you um, you know you buy a unit like there are retrofitted a series like three five houses that they're now like together and they retrofitted each unit and you buy the unit but at a, a price that if you wanted to sell it you wouldn't be able to to net all the the assessed value that might have occurred over time but it's more limited so that the next person who moves in could have it at more uh, uh, you know an affordable price so I think those kind of Things are like things that we need to work on, and 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 there are other kind of co-ops in Madison, like a long history of just housing co-ops where they live. Yeah, see, Dave lived in two of them, where you know you're in a big house and you live with people and share duties. But that's own. It's not the same thing as like you own a piece of like your unit. But there's different models, and I think we all of them have a place. In pass. Yeah. Kingfisher. Um, yeah, sure. It is 1.45, so we do need to start wrapping up, but um, go ahead, Joe Nathan, and why don't we make this the, the last comment here? Okay, um, I was traveling uh, out of reception for a Did my um, comment on the chat get answered about McCarthyism? I'm not sure that I saw that. Okay, real um, quick. Um, I I, uh, I get that you know the capitalist model needs desperate people and you know desperate workers. Um, it, I think it's a little bit more specific. I mean, I had heard very specifically that back in the '50s in the McCarthy area, when rent was cheap and available, that there was Republican complaint about all these loafers around, and there was a very explicit effort to get rid of cheap housing. And so, I mean, in the sense that they've accomplished that now maybe they feel bad because their workers can't actually be there in their factories but um it, it's not just the capitalist model i mean there was a national program to eliminate intellectuals and to eliminate cheap housing uh so i mean can anybody respond to that I, i'm not quite sure is um you know what the modern equivalent of mccarthyism other than bringing a house speaker named mccarthy back but um all right pass I'm sorry, I don't know what McCarthyism is, is exactly. So is McCarthyism like wanting to not have quote unquote loafers around or? The Red Scare, anti-communism. Okay, I see. Um, give me one second. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, um, I just remember the term. So nowadays there's a new term. It's called banana. And it means uh what look, hold on, what does it mean? It, it's like build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone at any time. Something like that. It, they they call them bananas. And that's what <laughs> what you were just saying reminded me of. But I I shit you not, the Republicans are very very much so trying to do something about this affordable housing crisis again because they shot themselves in their foots and now they're they don't have <laughs> places for their workers to live um i uh for work um was recently in a um in a senate and assembly hearing meeting about that bill that um i was talking the bills that i was talking about and the Republican chair was like, um, said a couple remarks, one of which he said, we um, won't be punishing um, progressive cities. In fact, we'll actually be rewarding them with <laughs> using progressive policies. Um, and then um, he also went to the extent that, you know, government entities that uh, use, <laughs> that provide affordable housing are good. Um, and it, it was just two comments um, where it was very clear that although they really shot themselves in the foot and can't do, um, you know, or don't want to do inclusionary zoning and rent control, that's essentially what they're trying to get at nowadays. Um, so you know, it's good to see that there are, are um, there's hope on both side of, sides of the aisle to um, try to solve our affordable housing crisis. Thank right. you. Thank you, yeah. Okay, well, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. and. I think I can say, I think I can speak for all of us saying that, you know, this has been a fantastic conversation and, um, you know, some of us probably want it to go on even longer, as nice a day as it is. So, um, but yeah, so thanks again to our guests. So Sam Harshner had to leave already. Um, and, you know, thanks to John Duncan, Marsha Rummel and Juliana Bennett for taking the time to be here. Um, and share your perspective with us. Um, so now we're going to take a break. Uh, I think we had a 10 minute break. Um, and then once we get back, um, we'll, we'll get to the business section of the meeting. Um, all right, so right now it's 1.50. So let's break now and um, folks can be back by two so we, we can start on time. That'd be great, uh, thanks. See you soon. Good looking, everybody. Bye, everyone. I'm leaving you. Have a great rest of your meeting and be kind. Thanks so much, Marsha. Have a great day. Thanks. Same man. here. But thank you so much for the invite. Thank cool. you. Really enjoyed my time. Thank you, thank you Marsha, for being you here. <laughs> great Ms. information.
All right, so we're now at two. Uh, so folks can make their way back from break. We can start the business portion of the meeting. Right. So why don't we get going here? Um, so what we have on the agenda is reports from committees and local chapters, uh, followed by a discussion of the proposed bylaws changes. And um, people can read the text of those in our newsletter if you haven't already. Um, but I'll just drop that link into the chat. So that's to a you know PDF version of the newsletter, which shows the proposed bylaws changes. Um, so why don't we get rolling with our um, brief committee and chapter reports? Uh, so. I can start it off with, uh, you know, just a, a report from the membership committee, as well as communications. And, um, you know, on, on membership committee, uh, our main goals have been, first of all, to, um, you know, work on improving our membership system, uh, trying to get um, more monthly reporting uh, of, what our current uh, dues paying membership levels are, um, as well as information about memberships that are lapsing, um, outreach to members who need to renew their dues. And in addition, um, taking a look at our membership materials, um, things that we use for recruitment, things that we send to new members, uh, just updating those and um, you know, making sure that we have uh, everything working together in a good system. Um, so on the communications committee front, uh, we've been working on increasing our um, you know, output of content from the party, um, you know, particularly on our website, on social media. Uh, so folks may have noticed some of that. And we're also just working on um, basically uh, updating our, the design of some of our graphic design materials and kind of working together with membership on uh, you know, those materials that I talked about before. Um, so Bill, do you wanna give a, a brief finance committee report? Um, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um this will be an update from our last financial report at the February winter gathering. We've taken some steps in recent months to rein in operating expenses. Specifically, we've cut the costs of our online database server, Nation Builder. Uh, we've cut those costs by over 50%, and we've significantly reduced our bookkeeping expenses. This spring, we were able to make financial contributions totaling $1,500 to six green uh, candidates, most of whom were elected. We had $13,877 in our two accounts at the time of our February state membership meeting. We now have $14,323. The Wisconsin Green Party is a membership organization. Our only source of income is dues and donations. Of particular importance are the monthly online contributions that members make. That flow of income is the lifeblood of our organization. Just as a reminder, our annual dues are $36, $12 for low income, if you're not a member, please consider joining. That's my report. 
Um, we have a question on, on our end. How many members do we have currently? 61. Math that. Um, also, is, is the report um, accessible for us to read somewhere? People that weren't able to make it today? The finances report? Well, yes, your report, and then I know that. Sure. Center. I can um, I can make it available. I, uh, I don't have a comprehensive report to screen share today, uh, but I can I can get that report to people. Should be posted to our newsletter. Should be posted. Is it going to be posted on the website? It could be. <laughs> I can make one available for posting on the website. Thank you, Bill. I, I think what we need is that um, each each chair of each committee should be required to do that according, I believe it's according to our bylaws to make those reports available for membership to read. Consider it done. Thank you, Bill. What about you, Dave, and other chairs? Um, yeah, all, all of these reports should be available, you know, both if people want to watch the video of the gathering or in the notes. Um, That's all this information. The gathering now. Oh, where will we be able to find this uh, content? Um, we can post it on the website, just like Bill was saying. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Tom Stack. Go ahead. Um, so I haven't seen the posting of the winter gathering video. Is that forthcoming? Is that not posted? I could post it right now. Thank you. And can you can you make sure it shows up on the YouTube channel? You know, it shouldn't just be unlisted. You know, it should be a normal post. What do you mean? I mean, it's going to be at the top of the YouTube channel. Yeah, that I've it's seen. It's going to be like featured. Yeah, I don't mean to like insult you. I've seen I've seen some managers. They think. You know, just make sure it's public, not unlisted. That's all. Of course. Should be uh, visible now. All right. Thanks. Um, so why don't we go to an IT committee report? Sure, I can speak to that. Well, Bill touched on uh, one of the things that IT has been working on recently, and that is cleaning up the database in terms of, um, with the objective of saving some costs uh, in Nation Builder. And we've been able to successfully do that. Um, future projects for us um, include continue to clean up our database and um, update things for 2023 and going on and performing some routine maintenance, uh, things of that score, and then also reorganizing our Google Drive folder and um, just kind of doing some basic maintenance to keep things, uh, information current and smooth. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to add, Sam, pass. Uh, no, I think, I think you covered it. Okay, so we have Bill and Tom on stack. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I just wanted to note that the committee reports are all found in the uh, newsletter, which I think came out about a month ago. 
So each of the reports you're hearing now are updates from those reports in the uh, in the newsletter. But I think it would be a good idea to um, post this on the web the website as well. So Tom, you're next. Oh, oh. so Tom, uh, Tom. Yeah, Tom, go ahead. Um, so it's great. It, uh, I know that's a lot of work getting rid of those people and accounts. So I applaud that. And, you know, it's intense. Uh, pretty sure you made a backup of what you deleted. And you probably had a strategy as to who, what you did. So I'd like to see kind of a workflow documentation of you know how that project was um, done. So I don't know where you could publish that, but um, that would be that would be a good thing. Thank you. Okay, so um, do we have any um, other committee reports or local chapter reports? Be really well, I'm wondering if we have an elections committee that exists now. Yeah, yeah, the, um, the elections committee has been meeting. Um, so, you know, we recently had a meeting and there just isn't a lot going on elections wise right now. So there's not very much report. Um, Who is on the committee? So I am um, Melissa. Um, several people here are Uh, Joe Nathan Kingfisher, I, I thought I was. I attended the meeting. Yes, Joe Nathan is, as am I. So the only change of business, I, we're meeting every two months, right? Yeah, we decided that for now, the elections committee is going to meet once every couple of months. Um, you know, and that will probably pick up when there are more elections on the horizon. Um, so, yeah, I think that covers um, all of our committees. Um, so, Mike, uh, you want to give a Milwaukee report? Go right ahead. Uh, just a quick thing. Uh, since uh, I am over, uh, uh, overwhelmingly relieved and pleased uh, to report that uh, we have launched our uh, GMTP uh, donate page on the uh, on the MilwaukeeGreens.org website uh, as of. Thursday night, uh, you can uh, securely contribute money to GMGP directly uh, on our website on our website at milwaukeegreens.org slash WP slash donate. Uh, we can take one-time donations, uh, monthly donations, and uh, if you go through a, a slightly cumbers a slightly less cumbersome process you can also uh, join, renew uh, your membership and pay your dues uh, in uh, basically one fell swoop. Uh, so uh, that's pretty exciting. And many thanks to Barb Eisenberg for supplying much of the information that we needed uh, to set up the page. And uh, we also announced that to the GMGP discussion list this morning. 
Thanks, Mike. Mr. Sam is on stack. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, for the uh, policy and platform committee, uh, we do have um, a few things to report on. Uh, so, over the past uh, quarter of the year, we um, made statements that were uh, keeping track of issues with the Lac du Flambeau um, road closure uh, dispute, um, as well as issues with um, pipeline safety. Uh, and Joe Nathan might be able to um, speak uh, to more detail on those since he was the one that um, crafted those statements. Um, but other business uh, for the committee, um, we're uh, looking to um, essentially form um, a partnership between the platform and policy committee and the communications committee, um, uh, like an ad hoc social media subcommittee um, with the purpose of leveraging what's already in our platform um, to make statements on issues of the day. Uh, we've begun um, posting more to our social media channels, um, which has boosted um, reach and engagement substantially. Uh, and uh, I think last I looked, we were at like 408% um, increase in engagement with our social media content. Um, this has been used to uh, drive traffic to our website, you know, where we're also seeing uh, more engagement and longer browse times there as well. Uh, so it, it has been paying off. So um, one thing I'll say about that is that uh, you got to be consistent with it. Um, you do it, you see it spike, you see it trend upward day after day after day. Um, but if you stop, then it, it kind of plummets. Uh, so got to be consistent with it. Um, the more you put in, uh, the more you get out of it. Um, so I see um, we've got a couple folks on stack, but I just want to give Joe Nathan an opportunity to speak on those two statements if he wishes to. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Well, um, I am here at Bad River. Here's a visual. We're driving down the road. Um, in a few miles, I can give you a visual of the river itself. And I just want to quote the tribal chairman, uh, Mike Wiggins uh, Jr. Uh, Mike Wiggins. Uh, the prior to this week, one week of river action took away as much river bank as remains to the pipeline. And if the river reaches the pipeline, the river is gonna take the pipeline and it's gonna open the pipeline to the river. And I'm not quite sure, I know a federal judge was asked to shut down the pipeline a couple of days ago I don't know what the decision was. I haven't heard any news. I don't know how uh, the tribal politics get done. Uh, this Bad River tribe has, this reservation nation has uh, protected the people of Wisconsin uh, from, from mine threats. The mine want, this mine wanted to take uh, <laughs> the whole place a mile deep give us every one of those valuable rocks every one of those valuable stones a mile deep to disappear a place and uh whatever tribal politics federal indian law was done saved the people of wisconsin including myself and my family and the threat is very real i just drove from duluth 
across and I've never seen so much swamped landscape. There is water sitting in this landscape. Like I have never seen it before. And that means the landscapes jumping and jiggling with a, a decrepit over the age limits pipeline just just dancing with the water uh, and the earth moving and we are in deadly peril <laughs> we are in deadly peril where i am speaking from right now so i really hope whatever is going on whatever federal indian law whatever tribal politics reservation nations i hope that bad river and uh waswagani all protect the people of Wisconsin. Thank you. Thanks, Joe Nathan. So I saw that Melissa um, wanted to give a Four Lakes Green Party report. So Melissa, please take it away. Yeah, I'll just be really brief and wanted to mention some of the things that Four Lakes has been working on lately since our last gathering. Um, mainly of note is that we um, endorsed a slate of candidates for the city council. Several of those people were speaking at our panel today. So um, we um, went through the endorsement process and had, um, had volunteer initiatives to help uh, Four Lakes members help these candidates get elected. So that was one of the things that we had been working on. Um, in March, we um, uh, to come to participate in answers weekend of action to observe the 20th anniversary of the Iraq invasion. There were several Four Lakes Green Party members who participated in a rally at the Capitol with um, other community groups such as um, World Beyond War, Veterans for Peace. Uh, the Madison chapter of PSL was there as well, if I recall correctly, and several of our Four Lakes members were there. And in April, we also uh, participated in World Beyond Wars um, protest walk to protest the arrival of the F-35s that have come to Truex Field. Um, so those are a few of the things that we have been um, doing in the Four Lakes chapter. Yes. Thanks. So, um, then it looked like Bruce and Bill. Um, we overlooked very one very important committee in the committee reports. According to our bylaws, um, section three meetings for the coordinating council. All minutes of minutes of all council meetings shall be kept by the recording secretary, which I assume we still do. And all policy and financial decisions and resolutions shall be published in organization organization's new letter, newsletter. So there is no report on the activities today from the coordinating council. And I'm specifically concerned with a meeting that was held a few months back, well, months back, when three members of the council were kicked off the committee. Duly elected members of the coordinating council were removed from the committee. I would like specifically a report on that meeting now. Yeah, can we um, can we provide the notes from the meeting in question? Sure, let me grab those quick. I also um, put myself on stack. So once I have those, yeah, notes. Bill's also on stack. So, and did you have a, a direct response to that? question or uh yeah i okay. i was going to provide a direct response to that question so just one second while i share these minutes for just a second it, i have a visual of the bad river right here 
And where I'm standing was all underwater and flowing a mile, a mile wide. And that's what has almost ruptured this pipeline, just so everybody can see. Thanks, Joe Nathan. All right. Um, so yeah, to to address that meeting, um, and first of all, I want to just provide a factual um, correction. Uh, two members of the coordinating council were removed. Uh, James Benkard is not ever was a member of the coordinating council. He his um, appointment to the membership outreach committee was rescinded. Um, so just a factual clarification there. Um, but yeah, so just to uh, quickly summarize um, what had occurred, uh, two members of the coordinating council, Barbara Dahlgren and um, Tom Rodman, um, had uh, misrepresented themselves in communication with other uh, entities, which resulted in um, information going out to the press, uh, which said that um, the Wisconsin Green Party had endorsed uh, an event in Milwaukee, which took place on uh, February 19th. Um, and so we um, basically were trying to figure out what, what was going on. I reached out to the Libertarian um, Party of Wisconsin co-chair who, uh, was a co-organizer of the event um, and was the individual who had submitted um, the information to the press um, that the co-chair of the Libertarian Party of Wisconsin, Jacob, um, indicated to me that the reason why he had uh, told the press that the Wisconsin Green Party had um, co-organized the event was because Barbara Dahlgren, a former recording secretary, uh, had communicated with him using her Wisconsin Green Party secretary credential. Um, so after that, we um, issued a statement to correct the record about what had occurred. Um, we sought um, you know, a process of accountability um, for what had happened. Um, neither uh, Barbara nor Tom seemed to um, be willing to take accountability for the miscommunication. Um, they were not responsive with other members of the coordinating council when we were trying to figure out what had happened. Uh, so we held a meeting um, with proper notice um, to consider uh, removing them from the coordinating council because they had misused their credentials as members of the coordinating council um, to communicate and had created harm. Uh, so we held the meeting. Um, some of you were there. Uh, so you, you saw what happened. Um, but I mean, uh, I guess, what I would say, just to wrap up quickly, is that uh, there really was not, did not seem to be um, any um, any awareness that uh, the conduct was inappropriate, um, and um, you know the the issue sort of got spun a bit. Um, I recall Barbara saying that. Well, I could have included a disclaimer, um, which I think misrepresented the issue. The issue was that she had proactively used her party credentials in the communication. With that said, that's not really the, the topic of, of this meeting, um, but just to provide that information, provide the minutes for that meeting. Um, so with that, I'll pass. These are the wrong minutes. There are no minutes, are there? Because it there is no record of this meeting. According to the rest of the membership, this meeting never happened.
Hold on. Sorry, I shared the wrong document. I shared the 315 minutes, and this was a 313 meeting. I apologize for that. Obviously, the dates are pretty close. Where were these uh, minutes up until today? Were these minutes ever approved by the Coordinating Council? They were, um, and they're housed in a folder on our Google Drive, which is accessible to um, all Wisconsin Green Party members. Stop. Um, that is wrong. Say that again. You got to stop him. Uh, let's see where they're housed, because I've, I mean, I've, I've been doing the recording secretary role for quite a while, and I have not seen any minutes in there about this meeting until um, I'm looking at the link right now. Um. Yeah, I mean, here you go. There's a link to the folder. I mean, one thing I'll I'll also just comment is that um, it is the responsibility of the recording secretary to, um, you know, maintain the minutes, seek approval for them, um, and. After uh, Barbara was removed from her role as secretary, she had inquired about where the improvements were. Um, so at the time I looked into it and I had found that actually when she had assumed the role as secretary is when um, the practice of approving meeting minutes seemed to have fallen off, I mean, at least based on where the documentation was stored on the Google Drive. So, I mean, I appreciate what, what Barbara is saying and, and this push for transparency. I wish that that push would have existed when she was actually in the role and would have been empowered to, to do so. Um, I, I feel similarly about the, uh, about the YouTube channel. I mean, as recording secretary, you would think that she would have played a more active role in maintaining those records and ensuring that they were accessible to our membership, doing things like trimming them down so that they would um, be useful to our membership. Um, during never, her time as, as recording secretary, I don't recall that ever occurring. Past. I never had access to that. Wait, hold on. So we, we have a stack. All right, so Bill has been on stack waiting for a while now. Um, so yeah, and I see also that Tom is on stack. Um, so let's not have any of this, you know, arguing back and forth, please. We have a stack, so let's let's respect it. Uh, Bill, go ahead. My uh, comment may seem Bill, you are Bill, muted. You got muted. Sorry about that. Okay. No, I was going to just say that. Um, my comment is off topic, but the topic I'd really like to dwell on is the one we were previously on, and that is um, how to make our committees more effective and how to improve our website. And I'd just like to note that I am thoroughly impressed with the website just in the last couple of months. And I'd like to applaud uh, Joe Nathan and Sam and whoever else has been working on these um, blogs these it, the the political content of the web page has improved and the quality of the um the entries has, has been high high level i guess i'm not surprised that we've gotten a lot more traffic and i would like to make a um request or a plea to some folks in our ranks who are very good writers and i think could also uh author some excellent material for the website and that would be people like mike and barbara and others um i i really like the, the the direction in which the website is going now on the question of on the subject of um our google uh drive i hate google i have such a hard time um manipulating it and making use of it and I really think that we have to work um, and put a lot of work into uh, the administrative side of the uh, of the state party. And it would needs to start with um, working on and cleaning up 
in reordering our Google Drive so that it can be um, a better resource for us. Um, I don't know if I don't have the permissions or if I just don't know what I'm doing, but I, I want, I've gone in there and tried to reorder things a little bit so it would be more useful for uh, leadership and for our members and uh, finally um, gave up on it. And I've had some conversations with folks on the uh, coordinating council and I think we, we need to put some more work into um, in, into reordering our, uh, our Google Drive. I'll pass on that. Thanks, Bill. So Tom is on stack. And let me also just point out that we're now at 236. The meeting ends at 3. And we still have a discussion of proposed bylaws changes on the agenda. So let's try to keep things moving here. Um, Tom, go ahead. Tom, I can't hear you. Is Tom there? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, I like the idea of spreading the work out. It shouldn't just be two people doing all the IT work. It should be a committee. Sometimes it doesn't, it can spread beyond the IT committee. We need volunteers to go in and set up the permissions on that public approved minutes folder so that all 61 people can read it. I just looked at the folder right now and there's roughly two dozen <coughs> uh, accounts that explicitly have access and several of those are not members. So it's factually incorrect to say that the minutes are, the approved minutes folders has a list of, has an access control list with explicitly all members. Secondly, um, I'd like to make a proposal to table the vote on the bylaws changes until the next membership meeting. Second. Uh, second by. Okay. All right. I mean, I object to the, the proposal, so I have to go to a vote. Has to go to a vote. The proposal. Okay, so there's a proposal to table the bylaws uh, until well, the next meeting. Can I make a comment on that? Uh, the reason uh, showing sure. it, we, we historically, there was a precedent. It wasn't written, but it was a good precedent. I haven't had time. I'm retired. I didn't have time to read through all those, that, that proposal. Yeah, we're all busy, right? I don't understand it it's not enough so uh the the precedent even though it may not have been written it was logical you, you put the changes out and you give the membership a couple of months to to uh, discuss it pass okay so i see bruce and bill are on stack go ahead bruce Yes, it, previously it took two readings basically of bylaws changes. That's been whittled down to just one. Uh, originally in our bylaws, the changes are introduced at the fall meeting or a spring meeting and then were discussed again at the next membership meeting. I thought that was a good policy, but we don't do that anymore. So I second the motion to postpone discussion of this. And we need a way for people to actually discuss. We need uh, a group where people can post just like the GPUS does with the coordinating uh, with the um, national committee where proposals are made and there's at least three weeks of online discussion about any proposal. And we need that. We need some kind of way to put 61 people 
to in this party to be able to communicate with each other and discuss these kind of things and bring up issues on their own. Discussion. Perhaps, perhaps issues that might lead to their own desire for bylaw change. But in addition to that, I think we're running out of time here because uh, Corning Council has still not told us what else they've done. What have you guys been doing for the last, I don't know, you didn't say anything in, in, in January to the winning meeting. So what have you guys been doing for six months? I'd like to know the resolutions, the uh, treasurer's reports, everything, you know? I mean, we need that information as a membership to decide how this party is proceed. Because I think the coordinating council has forgotten it. They're at the uh, service of the membership and not vice versa. That was always been the intention of this party is as the membership is primary and decisions of the membership come first, coordinating council serves the membership. Okay, uh, Bill's on stack and then me. Some folks may find this surprising, but I support Tom's uh, proposal. I think it would be beneficial for the party to have a relaxed and um, conscientious discussion of the bylaws, proposed bylaws changes. And um, I think that the practice that we've had in the past of rolling out bylaws, discussing them, uh, giving people plenty of time to weigh them, it has been a good one. Whether or not it's required by our bylaws is, is secondary. The, the practice has been useful. Secondly, I'd like to um, applaud Tom and Bruce uh, in particular, also Barbara, for the, the tone of the discussion today. I think this has been a useful discussion. I think we would best use our time today by beginning a discussion of the bylaws, and we can continue that discussion um, leading up to our next, um, our next gathering. Uh, one thing we had talked about on the coordinating console, we're talking about uh, what have we been up to? Well, uh, the IT committee had um, an idea that they were working on some time ago about having a statewide uh, discuss, discussion listserv. Well, we've been uh, working on that. The IT committee has been working on it. We, I think there was uh, some intention to roll that out at the meeting today. I don't believe we'll have time, but uh, I hope we were able to go forward with that because I think we could continue the discussion on the merits of the bylaws proposal, um, both online with the discussion uh, list and also uh, leading up to our next, um, our next gathering. Um, and then the other thing I want to just note once again is um, Sam and I had uh, uh, an in-depth discussion about the Google Drive, and I think, and, and we, we both noted that the criticisms we've heard today of it um, are valid. It needs some work. It needs some reordering. Um, we need to, to, to double down and, and get some of that um, done so that it can be um, readily available to everyone. Um, it's got, there's a lot of good stuff in there, a lot of useful stuff that we've accumulated, and it needs to be um, worked on. I'll pass on that. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, and I want to say that, you know, I agree with a lot of the ideas and, you know, requests that are coming out here. Um, because, yeah, you know, the more information that members are able to access, the better. Um, you know, as, as Sam noted, it's not like these issues are new. Um, but, you know, one thing that I think in response to what we've been doing is, you know, we've been trying to deal with some of the issues that, um, you know, have been pointed out. And so, uh, you know, when people point out uh, issues like that, it is helpful. Um, you know, I would suggest that 
people don't need to wait for a gathering if there are issues like that. I mean, but I guess what it comes down to is, yeah, there hasn't been a great way for members to communicate and, you know, for communication with officers and members. I mean, I think, you know, pretty much everyone here has my contact info and others. So it's not like we can't, um, you know, communicate with each other. But yeah, I mean, I, I think what it comes down to is we could all do better. So, you know, one thing that, you know, as Bill mentioned, we've been working on a email list um, that members can opt into to discuss proposals that are before the party. And, you know, I think we've all agreed that that's something that has been needed. And, um, you know, the devil's in the details because it's been pointed out, you know, the national committee email list, um, you know, is kind of people dread to get on it. And uh, there's so many complaints about it. So, you know, and, and other organizations have had similar experiences. So it's not, you know, it's much easier said than done to have that sort of uh, communication forum that is, you know, is really a positive thing for everyone involved. But, you know, that's what we're going towards. So I wish we had been able to implement that earlier. Um, but, you know, basically we are, you know, in addition to some other improvements to um, you know our technology that have been mentioned we've been working on that so that's pretty much ready to roll out um, you know as for the bylaws proposals I mean they yeah they did go out in the newsletter um, and although it may seem like a lot of text you know all the changes are kind of in the same direction um, which is just to say that the you know all the dues-paying members in good standing should be able to have their voice heard on decisions that are before the party. Um, I think that is just a really good policy and that will make things more democratic. It means, you know, if you can't make a particular meeting, you're not disenfranchised. Um, and together with our email list, you know, I, I think those are two pieces that go together because people will be able to discuss the issues that are before the party and then everyone will be able to vote on them. Um, you know, I also agree that, yeah, for a long time we had a practice of, um, you know, having two meetings for proposed bylaws changes. And, you know, I, I think I, that was sort of a practice. It wasn't, uh, written, but, um, you know, I, I thought it definitely had its benefits and considering where we're at right now in the calendar, I don't think that it's, I mean, I think it's a good change and I support it 100%, but I don't, at the same time, I don't think it's so urgent at this point in time that I don't see like any real downside to taking more time just to make sure people understand it. and. Um, you know, that we're able to actually, uh, you know, get used to our new email list and discuss it. So I would be happy to, to move forward with, um, you know, the vote on, on these bylaw proposals. But, um, you know, if, if a lot of people are concerned that, uh, you know, and which is understandable given that we haven't had the email list up for discussion. Then, you know, I, again, I have no problem with taking more time. Um, so, let me see. Just, I don't know if someone has been taking stock of the stack. I see Bill and Barbara. I don't know if anyone else has tried to get on the stack, but um, go ahead, Bill. Um, I would defer to Barbara since I've already spoken. Uh, and then I'd like to speak after Barbara. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to plug in my computer at this exact second, but um, what I was going to say is there was a little bit of discussion in the chat about how Bruce is not a, a, a member. Now, we all know that's silly. Of course, he's a member. He should be in good standing since he said he just, just, he just paid. Money today. 
Um, but you know, this is a major problem with our membership in general that people have no way of finding out if they're in good standing or not. Um, now, I, I think the Nation Builder sends out some kind of a um, an email notice to people if they're uh, about to lapse or something, but most a, a lot of people that goes to spam or they never get it. Um, so that's that's a major problem if we're going to have everything is online voting like we have been doing. I'm I, I don't um, I, I think that it was just a bad move for us to just put everything on Nation Builder. People can show up at these meetings right here. Uh, in person and online. We have uh, more than what, about half of the people now in this room here, almost half. And we've got a good hybrid setup. We all can use thumbs ups or the chat or whatever to cast votes. And that way everybody can see if we're all online um, on uh, OPA vote, then the people who are facilitating are often the people who are the ones running for offices, the ones who benefit most, who are already in leadership. And it's, uh, it's if we're gonna be a party that's supposed to be democratic, we've gotta practice what we preach about transparency. And that it's just not been very transparent and nobody can find out if they're members or not. Um, and, and it goes up to this time, I'm, I'm seeing uh, Dave says that, or somebody, somebody said that they saw Bruce's renewal. Um, but you know, these things are constant issues here because we haven't been doing a very good job with our membership. And that doesn't just fall on some people, that's, that falls on me too. Um, now, like, it would be much easier for us to move forward if um, if people stop getting kicked out <laughs> of um, being able to do anything, and um, for us to have a more respectful tone. Um, there's definitely it, I received about 80 pages of allegations against me before that meeting that apparently now has minutes, and it was incredibly disrespectful to me. Um, calling me all kinds of names. And I don't deserve any of this. I have been here for <laughs> my entire adult life working for the Green Party. And all of a sudden I'm torpedoing meetings. I'm, uh, I'm possibly a threat to the entire infrastructure of the Green Party. It's just ridiculous to care to demonize any member like this. We're on our own time. It's a beautiful day out and we're sitting in here on a Zoom call. Um, so we need to, to be generous to each other. And, um, you know, I, I think I've been pretty generous to, to my colleagues and I wish that they wouldn't call me a, a, a Nazi and a bigot and a transphobe and a, you know, a everything, every name in the book I've been called by, by my colleagues at this point. Um, it's just, it's ridiculous and destructive. And we need to get back to helping out, figure out who, who our membership even is and actually giving them a call once in a while, meeting, meeting in person and doing things in person. Uh, I was called Nazi adjacent in your letter, Dave Schwab. And I was also called a liar several times. Uh, they actually had to change facilitators because of how many times Dave called me a liar. You know, this stuff is just, it's so destructive. And I've developed a pretty thick skin over my several years of petitioning and all kinds of other stuff that I've done for this party. But I'm, I'm a rare case um, and you're stuck with me. So, <laughs> so deal with it, Pat. All right, thanks, Barbara. Um, so next on stack, we have Josh Anderson. Hi, 
Hi. Uh, you know, it's been a while since I, you know, I've been a at any of these meetings, but I have to say I am completely disappointed in the tone that has been taken. And I see that. Um, I, I think the fact that people don't see that uh, four CC members voting out two, it brings a lot of questions of process, a lot of questions of integrity. Um, I, I am completely baffled. I mean, I am seeing this here today and I am beyond steamed at the way I see people talking and the way I see people treating Barbara. I know how much she has done for this party and how much she has done for all of us. When my sister ran, you know who collected the most signatures for her? It was Barbara. Number two was Tom. So the fact that we continue to disparage them this way is completely insane and completely counterproductive to any mission that we all share. And if I continue to see this, it, it, I don't know what I'm going to do, but this, this is just completely frustrating. And, you know, I, I, I think everyone, especially those on the coordinating committee, need to take a good, long, hard look at themselves, the way they're conducting themselves, and, and maybe make some changes on their end. Pass. I believe I'm on stack. Go ahead, Bill. Well, actually, Josh, I am really encouraged by this discussion today because the tone of the discussion today is a big step forward for us, given what it's been the last couple of months. Um, I wanted to note that um, Everything Barbara said about the management of our um, tracking of our members is exactly on target. And it's really an area we need to work, um, work on. And um, we've been looking at it um, on the membership outreach committee, and we know we've got to do better. Um, 61 members, that's not good. That's about half of what we had several years ago. Um, and if we really uh, get back to, if we really figure out how to track um, and um, properly notify our members about dues and so on, I think we'll see an improvement in our, in our, um, in our dues collection and, and the number of members. But I, what I wanted to really speak on is, is, is something different, and that is on, on the subject of intent. It's been the intent of the coordinating council, the intent of the bylaws change uh, proposal is to increase membership engagement and to increase membership involvement in decision making. Now we can talk, and we'll have, a, I think, a vigorous discussion and maybe debate about whether or not the bylaws change proposed uh, reaches that objective. Uh, do we want to make that change? Uh, is that the kind of change we want to make to uh, reach that objective? But, but the intent, my intent, everyone's intent on the coordinating council is to increase membership involvement. Now that also has to go with um, another proposal, and I have to give uh, uh, I have to note the authorship of the proposal, and that is um, the idea of going from two um, state gatherings a, a, a year to four. Now, Sam was the author of that, and he pushed it and motivated it based on uh, the fact that we've only got two functional chapters in the state, and then we have members scattered all around the state. And we've all gotten used to using Zoom, and we found that um, it, 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 you know, it's it's both a curse and a blessing. And we've been able to draw a lot of at-large members scattered around the state into the fold of the uh, the party um, uh, through Zoom, and moving to four gatherings uh, a year. The idea was to to increase and improve our links and engagement with the membership. And it's the same thing that also motivates the idea of setting up a statewide discussion uh, list uh, to encourage uh, 
debate and discussion and involvement and engagement by our widely scattered membership. So um, I think we should at least get half credit for intent. Maybe the proposals aren't as good as they, they could be. Maybe they need some more work. Uh, the bylaws proposal will be either accepted or changed or modified somehow, but uh, I think the, the, the intent should be taken note of. I'll pass on that. All right, so see that Rita is on stack and I'm on stack as well. And it's now three, so, um, you know, I think at this point we have to wrap it up. And then we have a proposal ahead of us, whether to table uh, the bylaws proposal. So um, let's just finish up stack, let's vote on that, and then we can adjourn for the day. Uh, go ahead, Rita. Hi, I'm Rita Maniotis, um, and I'm actually Barbara Dahlgren's mom. I'm a member of the Illinois Green Party and a new member of the Wisconsin Greens because I'm moving up there in June. Um, I have a place uh, in Milwaukee. So uh, I just wanted to uh, say that I was glad that I was able to get into your meeting finally, but I had a real difficult time with the technology trying to get in the Zoom meeting. Um, so I want to make that known. And also, I want to let you know that we have had some of the same um, difficulties in Illinois with um, problems with, um, you know, people, conflicts, uh, philosophical conflicts, uh, conflicts of, uh, you know, disagreements. And uh, we lost Rich Whitney and Paula, um, uh, anyway, his wife Paula at, during that time. And I think part of this comes from our, our separate, our social distancing and only um, communicating electronically. And I think, you know, I, I have told the, in Illinois um, folks, because a lot of times they disagree with me, um, that I really appreciate that uh, we can have our disagreements, but we can also work together. So I'm, I'm uh, hoping that all the Green Party, I think all the Green Party is kind of suffering from this, and I hope that we can overcome these difficulties. And I'll pass, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I I certainly agree with that, and you know I think, um, you know it. I feel like there there's a lot of um, not the full story going around, and it is it's very tempting to want to correct that, you know what you perceive as uh you know issues but you know that said again it's it's at the end of the meeting we're all kind of at the end of our tolerance for meeting time and um you know it's probably best that we just try to keep things moving here um you know i will say again that you know we do want to improve transparency we do want to improve communication uh, we do want to make things more democratic. I mean, again, this bylaws proposal is about making things more democratic. I know people who are working now, you know, working class people who are working on Saturday. Uh, there's people who have childcare obligations and they can't make it to a three hour meeting. Um, you know, there's people who just don't want to deal with uh, conflict ridden meetings every, <laughs> every few months. And I think many of, us are in that category um it's like we have other ways of talking to each other other than bringing up grievances once every three months at a meeting and that's all i mean everyone is saying oh we need to grow more you know we have people come to our meetings and then people bring up all their old grievances and uh you know of course new people are not going to stick around because that's not that's not why any of us are here to be perfectly honest, but you know, all that said, again, I think you know we can move forward and deal with many of the important issues that have been raised. So why don't uh, we take a vote on this? So there's a proposal from Tom, um, which is to table 
the uh, consideration of the bylaws changes until our next uh, state gathering. Um, so if people want to vote in the chat, um, you know, if you, would, if you are in favor of the proposal to table, you can write yes or table. Uh, if it makes any difference, I uh, will withdraw my objection. So unless anybody else has an objection, I think that we can um, just move forward by consensus. Okay. Um, so uh, does anyone have any unresolved concerns or questions regarding the proposal to table the bylaws proposal? All right, not hearing any. All right, so I think we have consensus on that issue. So we will table the, uh, the bylaws proposal. And, uh, you know, like I said, we should be launching that email list soon, you know, so that all members will have the ability to, um, you know, discuss decisions that are before the party. And, um, all right, and so, we're past our time now, so why don't we adjourn? Um, I guess if there are any any final comments, then people can feel free to get on stack. But I say people can also feel free to leave since we're you know now at the end of our business. So yeah. uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well. I have one more issue. According to our bylaws, terms of office for people who are on the coordinating council. All officers except for the co-chairs may be elected for re-elected for successive terms. Dave, you have served as co-chair for six years. Uh, so you've been an illegitimate re leader for four years. I suggest you resign immediately because you're in clear violation of our bylaws. Bruce, you know well, nobody else wanted the job. You can run next time. <laughs> Have a great one, everybody. Go green. We don't need, we don't need a two co-chairs. Thanks, you, Nathan. Everyone There's have a great day. times when we had only one co-chair. So it does not excuse Dave violating our bylaws. Appreciate the feedback. Uh, move to adjourn. I second. All right, everybody have a nice day.